Please welcome Managing Editor of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, Danny Bouchakra. I want to take a moment to thank you all for joining us at this year's Election Law Symposium hosted by the Heritage Foundation and the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. We are particularly fortunate today to have with us our keynote speaker, Judge Chad Radler of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Judge Radler has been instrumental in addressing critical issues relating to voting rights, election integrity, and the legal frameworks that underpin our electoral process. Before his appointment to the Sixth Circuit, Judge Radler served as the Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division of the United States Department of Justice, where he defended President Trump's Commission on Election Integrity. Judge Radler also spent 10 years as a partner at Jones Day, where he worked on several election-related matters, including President Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. <clears throat> as we delve into the complexities of election law, voting rights, and campaign finance, we look forward to hearing Judge Radler's unique perspective on the challenging issues facing our electoral system today. With that, please join me in welcoming Judge Radler. Well, Danny, thank you for those kind remarks. Danny will be clerking for me in the coming years. So admittedly, it was in his best interest to offer a generous introduction, uh, but I appreciate it nonetheless. It's also nice to see a past law clerk here, James Lane, as well as many friends in the audience. So I was honored to be asked by the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy to present today's keynote address. In fact, it's long been a goal of mine to speak to the journal. After all, I learned about the journal even before I went to law school. During my senior year of college at the University of Michigan, and then over the ensuing summer, I worked for Spence Abraham, then a candidate for the United States Senate. He would later go on to win that election and serve a term as a senator, followed by an appointment as the Energy Secretary in President Bush's first term. During my time on the campaign, I became quite familiar with Spence's bio. His pedigree was impeccable, from Harvard Law School to Deputy Chief of Staff for the vice president. But there were two lines on that resume that, at least as a senior in college, did not resonate with me. One was an indication that he was the co-founder of something called the Federalist Society. The other was that he was the founder of a publication titled the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. So 30 years later, it is a privilege and something of a homecoming, given my ties to Spence, to be here as your keynote speaker an occasion I would not have anticipated during my stint as an upstart campaign staffer in the mid-1990s. But now that I'm here, I have 40 minutes to talk to you about any topic of my choosing. And I'm confident you will agree that the one I've selected is critically important. In, um, indeed, as important as it gets. No, not the election, not world peace, not even the baseball playoffs, but go Tigers. Rather, my topic today is me. Now, rest assured, I will talk about myself only to reflect on my personal experiences with election law, the theme of this symposium. And I will contrast my opportunities as an election lawyer, a pursuit shared by many of you here today, with those from my time on the bench, a privilege I hope you all hold as well during your careers. Because those experiences are quite different. Now on the bench, I even more admiration for the work of election lawyers. At the same time, I have a greater appreciation for the difficulties judges face in resolving the thorny issues that arise in the election law context. And in both scenarios, I feel the media, and to some extent the public, has been too critical of those engaged in these challenging endeavors. To that end, it is no exaggeration to say that election law litigation is not for the faint of heart. The cases typically move quickly with an election or other important deadline pending. The issues can be novel and often difficult, and the stakes can be high with a case's resolution potentially affecting the outcome of an election or the success of a ballot measure. Election law perhaps first captured the nation's attention during the 2000 presidential campaign. That year, the electoral results in Florida and in turn the nation turned on the counting of votes in a handful of Florida counties that had used punch card ballots. 
The manual recount process for those ballots helped coin terms like hanging chads, dimpled chads, and even pregnant chads, phrases that I, as a fellow chad, <laughs> have heard in jest many times since. The recount process in Florida displayed for the nation and the world the role that lawyers can play in a close election. Hundreds of attorneys, including John Roberts, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, descended upon the Sunshine State to take on tasks as large as crafting legal strategies for ensuing Supreme Court litigation, to watching recount workers in dusty rooms pour over thousands of paper ballots in painstaking detail. Some would argue that the strategies deployed by Republican lawyers in 2000 had as much to do in paving the way for George Bush's ascension to the presidency as did any political strategies utilized during the campaign. The 2020 campaign brought election law back to the public fore, but it seems in a rather dim light. Although the pandemic led to evolving practices that year, efforts to address those voting measures via litigation were often panned by critics. In particular, President Trump's initiatives to contest aspects of the election were met with sharp criticisms by the press and sectors of the public. Now true, some cases pursued by Trump supporters seemed frivolous from the start and were swiftly dismissed. Yet even where cases had some potential merit, lawyers were criticized for pursuing them, even to the point of being a target of the cancel culture movement. Having been confirmed to the Sixth Circuit in 2019, I did not litigate any election cases in 2020, nor did I have any meaningful role as a judge in cases pursued in the aftermath of that election. But four years earlier, in 2016, I served as a lead litigator for the Trump campaign, working under the direction of legal chair Don McGahn. That year, candidate Trump prevailed in virtually all of the significant election litigation matters that arose in the days leading up to the election and in the weeks that followed. And just like in 2020, some of the election cases filed in 2016 also lacked merit. But in that case, they were primarily cases filed by President Trump's opponents. In truth, cases like this are filed every election season, and it's understandable given the stakes. So save for extreme circumstances, I do not think we should be shaming ambitious candidates and their lawyers for pursuing election litigation as we witnessed all too often in 2020. So perhaps it's time to step back and reflect on the proper light by which we view election litigation. Let me do so in the context of the 2016 election where I participated in many of the memorable cases from that season. The cases that perhaps drew the most attention pre-election were filed roughly a week before election day. In a batch of filings, the Democratic Party sued the Trump campaign and a host of state Republican parties to prevent defendants from, quote, engaging in voter intimidation activity from the time of filing until the end of election day. In effect, the Democratic Party wanted an injunction barring the Republican Party from participating in electioneering activity at the polls, despite decades of precedent to the contrary. Why? Because according to their com complaints, the Democratic Party was worried about Trump supporters coming to the polls to do things as outrageous as wearing red hats while loudly supporting their candidates and monitoring for election irregularities. If you think these cases might sound like their origins were more in politics than law, let me help you further those suspicions. One, although plaintiff's primary cause of action was asserted under 42 USC section 1985, a longstanding and well understood statute addressing conspiracies to violate one's civil rights, the Democratic Party referred to the law ubiquitously by its much more dated moniker, the Ku Klux Klan Act. Two, these cases were filed only in the following states, Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. It's likely not lost on you that these were the expected swing states in 2016. Most of the cases were rejected outright or after a brief round of litigation. For example, in Pennsylvania, the case was dismissed after the district court chastised the plaintiff for unnecessarily delaying its lawsuit and creating, quote, a judicial fire drill without reasonable explanation. 
The case in North Carolina was similarly dismissed after the district court found, quote, only a handful of hearsay reports that purported supporters of the defendant's presidential nominee may have threatened or intimidated voters. Only one case gained any traction. In Ohio, a district court enjoined the Ohio Republican Party and the Trump campaign from any election day activity. The court justified its decision issued four days before election day on then candidate Trump's quotes, comments encouraging rally attendees to monitor certain areas as well as promises from Trump supporters to aggressively patrol polling places. In a footnote, the court clarified that those quote promises derived from one Boston Globe article which quoted a 61 year old Ohioan as stating that he would make select voters quote, a little bit nervous at the polls but would do nothing illegal. Now for good measure, the court also enjoined quote, Clinton for presidency in the same respects. Despite the facts that one, the Clinton campaign was not a party to the case. Two, the plaintiff, again the Democratic Party, did not request such relief, understandably. And three, the campaign's actual name was Hillary for America, not Clinton for presidency. Facing a wholesale ban on election day activity, the Trump campaign had little choice but to seek immediate relief. So we did, filing an emergency submission with perhaps America's most esteemed judicial institution, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> in our motion, we highlighted the perceived flaws in the district court's analysis, culminating the point this way. Finally, plaintiff imputes unlawful connotations to this pro prospect that many voters and observers may wear red colored clothing to the polling place. But plaintiff conveniently omits the fact that supporters of its nominee for president are planning to wear coordinated clothing on election day themselves. And here, we quote a Wall Street Journal article titled, Hillary Clinton supports plan to sport pantsuits at the polls. <laughs> Neither pantsuits nor red Buckeye jerseys, we explained, put voting rights at risk. The Sixth Circuit unanimously agreed that the district court abused its discretion in issuing the injunction and accordingly granted an emergency stay of the temporary restraining order. The following day, now the day before election day, the Supreme Court denied review of plaintiff's request to lift the stay, the Sixth Circuit's emergency stay. No justice issued an opinion accompanying the cert denial other than Justice Ginsburg. She wrote a two-sentence concurring opinion which simply reminded readers that, quote, Ohio law prescribes voter intimidation. Some speculated at the time that she did so not to highlight Ohio's run-of-the-mill prohibition on voter coercion, but rather to make, the, make plain that she would not be recusing herself from matters involving Donald Trump, whom she famously criticized in the press earlier in the year. The eventual dismissal of these thin complaints was perhaps predictable, but the election results were not. And what amounted to a surprise to most election followers Donald Trump defeated Hillary Clinton. What ensued was more unsuccessful election litigation inspired by Trump's opponents. First up were recounts efforts in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, Green Party candidate and fourth place finisher Jill Stein requested a recount of that state's election results three weeks after election day and just hours before the deadline for doing so. The Clinton campaign soon joined the call for a recount. Litigation seeking to block the recount proved unsuccessful. So too, however, did the recount itself from the Clinton-Stein perspective. Trump netted over 100 additional votes and was again declared the winner of the Badger State's 10 electoral votes. Michigan proved to be far more in, a far more interesting case from a legal perspective. There, Stein received approximately 1% of the 4.8 million votes cast in the state's presidential election again registering a fourth place finish. Nonetheless, she petitioned for a recount. She alleged, as Michigan law required her to do, that she was, quote, aggrieved on account of fraud or mistake. You might be asking yourself, how could a fourth place finisher, one over 2.2 million votes short of the winner's total, be, quote, aggrieved by the election results, let alone by fraud and mistake? We were asking ourselves the same question. Yet over our objections, state administrators ordered a recount to commence a few days later. Selection of that date was consistent with Michigan law, which allowed a short interim period 
for election officials to organize recount efforts before the recount was to begin. At the same time, a proceeding challenging the administrative recount order was pending before the Michigan Court of Appeals. By all accounts, the state was timely and carefully handling Stein's request for a recount under state law. Executive officers had granted her request, albeit over objection, and judicial officers were deciding whether that decision complied with state law. But before the state process had a chance to unfold, Stein filed suit in federal court, seeking an injunction requiring Michigan to begin its recount immediately. And to our surprise, the district court agreed to the request, ordering the recount to commence at once. According to the district court, Michigan's two-day recount waiting period likely violated some aspect of First and 14th Amendment rights. In the course of that decision, the district court seemed to proceed on the assumption that the presidential election was not conducted in a fair manner. Without elections that are conducted fairly, the district court wrote, quote, public confidence in our political institutions will swiftly erode. Evidence of irregularities in the election, however, was all but absent. Yet with that, state election procedures were washed away by a largely undefined due process wave. Happily, sanity would soon be restored. The Michigan Court of Appeals held that Stein, as a fourth place finisher who never claimed she'd be made the winner of the election following a recount, had not been aggrieved under state law and thus had no right to seek the recount. The state court accordingly issued a writ of mandamus ordering state officials to reject Stein's recount petition. And when the Michigan Supreme Court left the appellate court's decision in place, the recount was halted. So too then was the federal court litigation. Following these state court rulings, the district court dissolved its injunction. As an aside, it's not clear that a full recount could have actually been completed in the Wolverine state in 2016. As reported in the media at the time, voting machines in several precincts in Detroit tabulated more votes than voters in the precinct. As a legal matter, state law barred a recount in places where the number of votes and voters did not match. And even were a recount to occur, what could explain the bloated voting totals at certain polls in the Motor City? One answer flowed at the time attributed the voting irregularities to malfunctions in the city's ballot scanners. When voters inserted their ballots in the scanners, the theory went, the machines sometimes jammed, causing them to count more votes than voters. Given the location of those troubled precincts, the overvotes likely benefited Clinton. So had Clinton narrowly won the state, a recount undoubtedly would have ensued, perhaps making Florida's 2000 recount look like a well-oiled machine by comparison. That leaves Pennsylvania, and there things were perhaps even more unusual. According to papers filed by Stein, cybersecurity experts had concluded that there was possible fraud in the election. Russian operatives, Stein suggested, may have hacked the voting machines in Michigan and Pennsylvania by infecting them with malware. In ensuing state court recount litigation, Stein unsuccessfully sought a forensic examination of the state's voting machines. Pennsylvania law, the court explained, does not allow for such an examination, nor would the, co nor would the cor court, quote, impose requirements the legislature has not seen fit to establish, especially when there was, quote, absolutely no evidence of any voting irregularities. Having failed in her state level recount efforts, Stein again turned to federal court, alleging that the Commonwealth violated her first and 14th Amendment rights. She asked the court to order Pennsylvania to conduct a recount on the grounds that the Commonwealth's voting machines might have been hacked. The district court denied her request, both on standing grounds and because Stein's, quote, suspicion of a hacked Pennsylvania election borders on the irrational. And with that, the election recount litigation came to an end. Now, objectors to 2016's election results had one last salvo. In the lead up to the December 19 vote of the members of the Electoral College, Democrat electors in a handful of states won by Clinton led a movement to attempt to convince electors in states won by Trump to band together and reject the will of the voters. Their plan, it was reported, was either to have Trump electors vote for Clinton, not Trump, or for a compromise candidate along the lines of Colin Powell or John Kasich. The electors believed it was their duty to oppose Trump's ascension to the presidency because, in their words, I quote, he's a demagogue, 
He would be a danger as president, and he is under foreign influence. Justifying the elector's decision to, again, quote, break the glass and activate our function as the last line of defense. Now, setting aside the two centuries of history that weighed against efforts by electors to override the will of the voters, the Electoral College members faced another problem. Most states barred them from voting for someone other than the elect election's winner, either by imposing penalties on the electors or allowing for their removal to ensure against so-called rogue or faithless electors. Though cases filed, through cases filed in federal court, electors in three states challenged the respective state laws binding their votes. Those suits in which we intervened on behalf of the Trump campaign all proved to be unsuccessful in district court. Each judge recognized the difficulty in upsetting a 200-year-old tradition via litigation filed just days before the meeting of the Electoral College. That tradition likewise cast doubt on the electors' claims that the First Amendment entitled them to act as essentially free agents to the point of setting aside the vote of the people based upon the electors' singular preferences. By another name, these efforts might have been deemed an attempted nonviolent insurrection. But as the cases uniformly failed, the Electoral College vote proceeded as it had historically. As you likely know, there's more to this story. In the years that followed, a circuit split evolved over the viability of state restrictions governing electors in future elections. The Supreme Court resolved the matter in advance of the 2000, 2020 election in Shafalo versus Washington. Writing for a near unanimous court, Justice Kagan concluded that the Constitution grants states broad power over electors to enforce pledge laws as well as sanctions for violating those laws. Why did I run through this lengthy recounting of litigation from the 2016 election? In part, to remind you that each election comes with its own set of legal issues, some foreseeable, some not. And to remind you that in every election season, we see litigation of all types, from meritorious to merely colorable but not meritorious to outright frivolous. The public outcry over election lit litigation in 2020 was enormous. In 2016, not so much. To my knowledge, none of the lawyers in the cases I've mentioned were attacked by the press, decried in public corners, or sanctioned by the courts. It remains to be seen how things play out for 2024. My hope is that, as was the case before 2020, lawyers are afforded some grace as they weave through the labyrinth of state and federal rules governing elections. The difficult in, difficulties inherent in these cases bear repeating. Start with the legal framework, which varies from state to state. Then consider fact development. Cases often are pursued with the benefit of only a modest record, given time constraints and uncertainties inherent in the election process. And then consider the unpredictable nature of election cases. Lawyers must react to developments that can be difficult to forecast, and they develop legal theories in real time to respond to new or changing circumstances. And they often do so, you know, bears reminding, under immense pressure given the stakes of these cases. So it should not be much to ask that we show decency and respect to the players on the field, even where, in the end, a case may have little to recommend it. That includes calls for shaming, sanctioning, and even prosecuting lawyers. In a small number of cases, those serious measures may be appropriate. But from my experience as a litigator, that is unlikely to be true in the vast majority of election law disputes. Now, let me shift gears and close with some reflections on election law from a judicial perspective. For those of us on the federal bench, the Supreme Court eased our burden in the redistricting context through its 2019 decision in Rucho v. Common Cause returning many of those matters to state court. Yet plenty of cases remain on topics ranging from election mechanics to ballot access to campaign finance to state processes for voter initiatives and referendums. Despite my history with election law, these are not my favorite cases to draw. I do not mind the challenge of a conceptually difficult case, which describes a number of the election law cases we see. Rather, my hesitation is more over whether judges are viewed as impartial actors in these sensitive cases. I fear we have reached an age where judges, when deciding cases with political ramifications, are viewed more as partisan actors than neutral arbiters. There are many reasons why this perception has developed, 
and I will not belabor them now. But I do think the criticism is quite often unfair. Indeed, litigation in the aftermath of the 2020 election should help counter the point. As mentioned, a flurry of cases ensued before and after election day. Those cases came in a variety of shapes and sizes, but most were filed by President Trump or his supporters, and nearly all failed. As mentioned, uh, Tuesday night during the vice presidential debate, judges of all stripes, including Republican appointees, heard and rejected those claims. According to the Washington Post, over three dozen judges appointed by Republican presidents ruled against President Trump at different points and in different cases. I would expect the same to be true in 2024 for Democratic appointees if Vice President Harris finds herself challenging aspects of an election that appears to have gone in favor of her opponent. I continue to believe that as judges, we do our best to be guided by law, not politics. I have two examples from my own tenure to help prove the point. If I've done any, nothing else today, I've likely established my bona fides in a prior life as a Republican lawyer. But in high profile election cases in my court, I've ruled against the Republican lawyers before me. The reason was simple. The law called for a different result. Take for example, a case involving a voter approved constitutional amendment governing the redistricting process in Michigan. In 2018, Michigan voters opted to jettison the state's traditional means of redistricting which for many years have been overseen by the Republican controlled state legislature in favor of an independent citizens redistricting commission. The voter backed amendment conferred the commission with exclusive authority to adopt district boundaries for the state and federal legislatures. Of note, the commission's membership consists of 13 individuals more or less selected at random from the pool of applicants with most state residents eligible to apply. To me, this manner of choosing the members of a redistricting commission was reminiscent of an observation in Justice Scalia's concurring opinion in Cruzen that a divisive issue of the day was just as well decided by, quote, nine people picked at random from the Kansas City telephone directory than it was the nine justices of the Supreme Court. But whatever one thought about the wisdom of drawing district lines in this fashion, I disagreed with the Michigan Republican Party's assertion in a case before me Daunt versus Benson, that the commission's structure and conflict of interest rules ran afoul of the First Amendment. The majority opinion in the case opted to deploy a balancing test loosely modeled after the Anderson verdict line of Supreme Court decisions, one I have criticized in two separate opinions. That test, especially as modified by the Sixth Circuit, confers unelected federal judges with too much discretion in resolving election related matters. Looking instead to history and tradition, and in deference to Michigan's strong interest in self-governance, I voted to uphold the commission's framework, albeit on grounds different from those invoked by the majority opinion. The second case worth mentioning is Weiser v. Benson. The dispute there centered on a pandemic era recall effort targeting Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. State campaign finance law allowed recall campaigns, as well as their targets, in this case, Governor Whitmer, to accept contributions in uncapped amounts, unlike contributions to election campaigns, which are capped at approximately $7,000. Any unused recall funds could be transferred by the candidate to her party. And that is exactly what happened. While the recall effort fizzled out due to problems with the petitioning process, Governor Whitmer collected over $4 million in recall related donations, which she then transferred to the state Democratic Party. The Michigan Republican Party challenged this seeming loophole in Michigan campaign finance law as violative of the party's first and 14th amendment rights. I agreed with my two colleagues on the panel that due to the way the Republican Party framed its injury in the case, it lacked standing to challenge the governing regulations, even though, as I noted in a separate writing, the recall exception, quote, magnifies the advantages of incumbency to the point where it puts challengers to a significant disadvantage. I hope these examples give you some assurance that I, like other judges, treat all sides equally. If you need more evidence of that, in my case, consider that I teach law at both Ohio State University and the University of Michigan. <laughs> but as to case law examples, you've heard more than your fair share for one keynote address. Let me leave you with this. Most judges I know are doing their best to follow the law, 
even in complex and politically charged cases. In 2020, a host of Republican appointed judges proved just that. Unfortunately, media narratives and social media threads all too often suggest otherwise, with little grounding, in my opinion. So far, at least, 2024 appears to be no exception. But I remain optimistic that better days are ahead. As we gear up for another season of election litigation, it is my hope that more grace will be afforded to attorneys litigating those disputes, just as it hopefully will be to the jurists tasked with resolving them. Thank you for listening. Thank you for that. Um, well, your, your talk was exactly down the grounds of, along the path that I, that I wanted to ask you questions about, which is, and I want to go to what you're talking about, the way uh, bar associations are now going after lawyers who represented uh, Donald Trump, uh, and in fact, you have criminal prosecutions uh, against some of them. Um, that, as you s said, that didn't happen in prior elections. It certainly didn't happen to any of the lawyers representing Hillary Clinton uh, in, in her recount attempts and so forth. And, and I don't quite understand the need for this either because in all of the cases that you were discussing, those federal judges had the ability, if they believed that the lawyers had made frivolous or meritless arguments, as you know, to sanction them. And that also did not occur. I'm wondering why this, why this change? Why has it gone from uh, lawyers being accepted for doing what they're supposed to do to now these bar associations and even attorney generals and others going after the lawyers for, for doing their work? Any idea why you think that has happened? Yeah, my two initial thoughts are one, I don't know, and two, even if I did, because I'm a sitting judge, sometimes it's hard to, hard to fully uh, opine on, uh, on certain matters if, if I had instincts about that. But, but what I, I do, um, you know, that the point of my talk was really that we do need to extend grace to lawyers litigating these cases. And uh, I, I made the point, and I'll make it again now, that there have been some matters uh, where, you know, the cases did, did appear frivolous at different times, and I think there are matters where it's appropriate for courts to get involved in that respect. But I think that's the vast majority, of it, minority of cases, and uh, lawyers need the ability to make arguments that are creative, that are you know, based on facts that are evolving, uh, and uh, especially true in election cases with short deadlines and the importance of those cases. So uh, I'm not commenting on any specific case. I don't have a case before me with, with these facts, but uh, I do hope that jurists are uh, viewing cases in that respect, understanding that lawyers are doing their best in difficult circumstances to represent their clients, uh, and also, the, you know, the public. I mean, the, the public has a role in this in terms of how they view uh, these matters, and I hope um, the public understands that lawyers are just doing, doing the best they can uh, to try to make sure that uh, things are conducted consistent with law. They win, they win, they lose, they lose, um, but that's the role of a lawyer. Now, I want to ask you a question, and uh, I, this is a delicate question, but uh, I'm not asking you. Get the message. The, right. My first response, the delicate questions right. are the hard ones. Uh, uh, so, I, I am not asking you to give us your opinion about, certainly about other members of the Sixth Circuit, but going back to when you were doing litigation for the Trump campaign, and frankly, when you were in the Civil Division. Uh, and by the way, I should mention, I wanted to personally thank you for the work you did at the Civil Division because uh, I was actually one of the members of Trump's Presidential Commission on Election Integrity, so I was the target of many of the lawsuits that were filed that you were, you were defending. Um, but here's my question. I, it, it's kind of been my observation after many years in this field that one of the problems in this area, particularly with election litigation, and I, I think a lot of lawyers who do this, frankly on both sides, would agree with me, is that um, many of the trial court judges, those down at the district court level, uh, many state court judges seem to have a very fundamental ignorance and lack of knowledge about election laws, both state and federal, and that one of the problems that lawyers have in this area is that often they have to do very basic education of those judges, and I'm wondering uh, whether you've encountered that problem. 
Well, we're generalists on the bench uh, because we get habeas cases and we get criminal cases and we get cases about other federal statutes. And so none of us are experts on everything and few of us are experts on, on much. Uh, we are generalists. So that's true in every case, but I, I think election law can be hard because uh, every state has its own set of rules. Uh, there's a federal overlay to that. Uh, we don't necessarily see these cases regularly, uh, and when we do, it can be a novel issue, it can be unique facts. I mean, 2020 brought, a, you know, brought about a whole new wave of cases because of the COVID pandemic. Um, so I, I think that's probably true for most cases, but, but sure, I mean, the good lawyer, of course, is gonna meet the court where they're at, and is gonna, whether it's starting at ground level or, or the fifth floor or higher, uh, and help educate the court um, to, to, you know, to why they need to reach a certain outcome. And that's, that's sort of the lawyer's job. Um, so I'm not gonna blame the judges uh, too much uh, for, for that. I, I think that's the lawyer's job to make these cases um, as understandable as possible. But again, I do think that a lot of times the issues are kind of evolving. So even the lawyers don't entirely know what's gonna be, you know, what's gonna happen next or what's gonna be under, under, under the next rock that we sort of look under. Um, so that makes cases hard on, on both ends. Um, when it comes to the election cases that come certainly before the Sixth Circuit and the other courts, uh, have you seen a significant increase in the number of cases coming up? Uh, and, and what of, of the cases you handle, I mean, are they a small percentage, a large percentage? It's a, it's a small percentage, but uh, just given the issues at stake, they probably get, you know, they, they sort of punch above their their uh, weight and the sense of attention paid to them maybe by the, by the public and the media. Uh, and you know, we have a multi-member court, so even if our court has cases, it doesn't mean that every member of the court hears every case. Uh, the one area I think we've seen probably an increase in cases uh, over time are issues involving ballot initiative and, and referenda. Uh, a lot of efforts in different states, including Ohio, where I live, to get uh, something on the ballot. You know, if you can get an issue on the ballot um, by state constitutional law and, and um, state statutory law, you just need 50.1% of the vote to, to amend the Constitution. And um, so that's been a very popular vehicle for people interested in public policy. And we're seeing a lot of issues about access to the, getting issues on the ballots and the signatures and wording and deadlines and that sort of thing. And I'm not gonna comment about, about any specific case, but that's probably one area we're seeing a little more than others um, in our circuit. Uh. There seems to be this general kind of division in the states when it comes to overturning an election. A, 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 a division in the legal standard used for this. In some states, uh, this legal standard is, and judges require that if you believe an election, if you're claiming the election should be overturned, um, you have to show a specific number of votes that were invalid or illegal uh, greater than the margin of victory. Whereas other states uh, have a more general principle and, and we saw that I think, for example, in a case in uh, North Carolina some, a couple of years ago involving a congressional race in which the standard is, well, you don't have to show a specific number of votes were invalid enough to uh, uh, go over the margin of victory. But you do have, but what you can show is that uh, there were so many issues, so many problems, so many uh, unlawful actions that it's impossible to tell whether enough illegal votes were cast to affect the margin of victory. I'm wondering if you just kind of, as a, as a general view, uh, view um, have an opinion on which of those two standards is, is a better standard that states ought to be using. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I do. Those are standards set by state legislatures, I assume, typically, yeah. uh, and states are free to do that. I, you know, I think just to back up, I mean, as, as a judge, I wouldn't, if I had a case along those lines, I wouldn't think about whether I'm overturning the election or not. I would just be taking the legal issues that come to me and deciding them, and uh, so you sort of have the legal question and you do your best to answer it and the chips fall where they may from there. Uh, so I, I assume judges are not probably thinking, do I want to over, you know, sort of do I want to overturn the election or not? Do I want to you know, look at the facts and law and, and see how they apply in that context? I don't know the answer. You know, in, in just more generally in legal doctrine, we sometimes apply abuse of discretion review. We sometimes apply de novo review. Sometimes we're looking for a fair assurance that something was correct. Those are all different sort of measures. We have you know, rational scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and, 
And so judges are usually pretty adept at uh, you know, moving between sort of one level review uh, or another, but um, that feels like a, a better question for the lawyers or maybe some state legislators. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to open up the uh, uh, audience for questions if you have. If you'd uh, like to ask a question of the judge, please go to the microphone uh, in the back. I see someone, I see uh, Brad going to the microphone. Go ahead. We usually ask the questions, so this is the rare chance, I guess, to uh, yeah. <laughs> turn, turn the tables. Judge, a uh, couple of things. First of all, thank you for coming, and, and I do want to say at the outset, we had um, Chief Judge Sutton come to our Federal Society chapter back in, in Wichita, and one of the things I want to congratulate the Sixth Circuit on is the transparency that it's now having in its assignment process. You don't see... Um, a lot of that in other courts and making sure that the kind of everything is, is evened out. He was talking about what a difficult task it is, and particularly in your court with, you know, former Chief Judge Boyce Martin and some of the issues that he had. So I'm really happy about that in the Sixth Circuit. Well, can I, uh, this is not your question, but I can say that we have a terrific Chief Judge who was uh, also in my career just, I was really fortunate to have him as a mentor, as a brand new lawyer. I started at Jones Day following my clerkship on the Sixth Circuit, and Judge Sutton was in practice then. I had a chance to work with him. Uh, probably the best lawyer I've ever worked with or, or seen in my, my time as a lawyer. Uh, and it's a privilege to serve with him now as our, as our chief judge. So yeah, we disagree from time to time, but he's a great, great, uh, great colleague. Um, my specific question, though, was is you talked about your, uh, the Daunt v. Benson cases. And, and one of the things you talked about, and I'd be curious your thoughts, I mean, that, that not only the, the Anderson verdict balancing test, which is common, and, and do you think that that can, um, I mean, you talked a little bit about that it puts the judiciary in, in the role of, of making decisions that are sort of outside of its expertise, but it also, just given the, I suppose you could call it flexible if you are in favor of it or others, but it, it can be sort of a result-oriented type of, of, of test as well, and it doesn't, it, uh, would you think that causes a lot of problems in terms of separation of powers um, and, and putting the judges in a role that really are kind of policy-making decisions? Yeah. I'd be you know, curious on your thoughts on that. When it comes to judging, I think of flexibility as more as a pejorative uh, term. Uh, so in these election law cases sort of prove that. Uh, in our circuit, and I've written on this, so you can read my, my opinions, but uh, we've crafted this sort of intermediate level of scrutiny for election cases that we apply oftentimes under Anderson verdict, where we look at sort of the burden uh, that uh, state restriction placed on the voter, and we weigh that against the state's justification for the need for the restriction. And that really, you know, to me, feels like it puts judges more in the policymaking chair than it does sort of the drawing the legal lines chair. Uh, and so I've, I've critiqued that, that measure uh, that we've employed. Uh, most circuits don't do it that way. Um, it's possible the Supreme Court would revisit this some some point because there are disputes across the circuits in terms of how they uh, deploy Anderson verdict. But I, I do fear that it, it puts judges um, kind of in the role of not really calling balls and strikes, but you know, uh, weighing the pros and cons, which sounds a little bit more like legislating than it does judging. And I do worry that that fear might contribute to some distrust in the judiciary that I mentioned during my remarks. Um, we don't think of ourselves as Republican or Democrat judges. We just think of ourselves as judges. But I, I worry that that's one example, but there are others where the public has decided that, um, uh, that we really do have sort of the D's and R's as we, as we go to the bench, and that informs, informs our decision making. So thank you, thank you for the question. And I probably have 50 pages of writing on this if you want, uh, if you want more. Uh, I'm going to ask another question, if I may, which is, it's a little bit, it's a little, a little bit off topic, but actually it's kind of on topic too because of the, the, as you know, there are so many government agencies these days that get involved in election and law issues, uh, not just the Justice Department. And I'm wondering yet whether uh, you and the other members of Sixth Circuit have come to grips with the changes caused by the U.S. Supreme Court, basically tossing out the Chevron Doctrine and going back to saying, uh, no, it's, it's, it's the judges, it's the courts who will determine uh, whether an agency is acting with, within the statute passed by Congress and the effect that may have on, uh, on election issues that come up. Yeah, so I think we will. Uh, it's still sort of a fresh issue, uh, given that uh, Loper Bright is um, you know, the ink's fairly dry on that decision. 
Uh, I will say that in my time, I've been on the court for uh, five and a half years. I don't think I had a single case where I um, was asked or went under went went through the process of, a, of a, um, a, a running through the two steps of Chevron. Uh, asked where cases where we applied Chevron deference. In other words, it just wasn't a doctrine that I was seeing litigated much uh, in our court uh, pre Loper Bright. Uh, during my time at the Justice Department, uh, we had stopped in some instances stopped asking for courts to uh, afford us Chevron deference. And so it's felt sort of like a, you know, a dying doctrine that's now been buried. Uh, and how it plays out, of course, we'll see in future cases. We're, start, we're starting to see some issues um, cropping up in that area, but I'm sure we'll see many more. Um, perhaps the Fifth and Ninth Circuit will see more of those cases than we do. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. But uh, it certainly could matter in election law, and just a whole range of, um, of cases as well. Um, and we'll take those cases as they come. Ben. Um, one, one area where I think judges do have at least some level of discretion uh, in election cases sometimes is, is when to take cases. Um, and there is kind of a push-pull between the value of deciding election law issues before the election so there's certainty for the voters and the campaigns and the value of maybe saying, we don't need to decide everything before the election because some of this stuff's gonna be moot, right? Election's not gonna be closed, you're not gonna need it. Do, do you have a sense in, in, of, of which is sort of the more, high, the higher value that, that you, would, you would take? And, and do you think that, that there's, um, is there a certain amount of, is, is that a shared value, I sure, guess I would ask? Sure. Um, well, in part, um, I was going to disagree with your question that as the Court of Appeals, we take every case we get. <laughs> so uh, I do envy the Supreme Courts around the country that pick and choose um, their dockets. But uh, you're right that in the range of cases that we hear, uh, even though we're required to hear them, uh, sometimes there are different principles. We're, we're, we're considering um, the Purcell principle is one that I don't know if you mentioned it specifically, but maybe that's what you had in mind where uh, federal courts at least try not to disrupt um, elections or election procedures too close to an election. Uh, I do think that doctrine carries a lot of weight. You see the Supreme Court citing it quite regularly, but I also suspect it's applied pretty unevenly across judges and across cases. Um, it's certainly something that uh, I think I've at least issued some cases where we've, we've mentioned or invoked the doctrine. I think it's something that's quite important because um, this is an area where certainty um, is better and uh, you know disruptions to uh, voting can cause ancillary issues that we like to avoid. So uh, certainly, and also when parties are seeking, you know, injunctive relief, there's a, as an equitable test, right? So we uh, consider lots of factors, including harm to the public and, and, and um, irreparable injury and that kind of thing. And so I think it's always better if we can decide these issues uh, when there's no pending election. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the faithless elector, the electoral college case that I talked about during my remarks is a good example. You know, if you're going to challenge 200 years of practice uh, regarding the Electoral College, doing it five days before the Electoral College is going to vote is not the you know, prime time, I think, to do so. And every court that heard the case recognized that. But as an issue going forward, there was at least some you know, historical precedent. I think from James Madison in the Federal Papers, the electors did have sort of an elevated role in, in society and in American life. And maybe they did have some independent discretion. And so that issue could be decided you know, with at the Courts of Appeals, with, it was past the 2016 election before the 2020 election, so there's a long runway uh, to do it. Uh, and the court then ruled how it did, but it wasn't doing so in the, in the, in the, you know, in the sort of emergency circumstances of an election. So I, I agree with, I think, what the premise is that, that um, you know, in some respects, courts should try to, to do no harm, I suppose, when it comes to election, elections, although there are certainly cases where courts can and should move quickly. Professor you. I thought Dan McLaughlin was going to ask a question. I got to <laughs> ask one too. And then I was going to ask the judge if he was going to join Jim Ho's ban on hiring from law schools that don't protect free speech. But then I thought of a real question much more important than Jim Ho. So the question is, that's a joke. He used to work for me at the Justice Department. So here's the question. The first two panels, something I, I, I saw expressed repeatedly was that most of the scholars and experts who get into election law tend to be from one side of the debate. Uh, so the question I had is, what other kinds of uh, experts would courts be willing to entertain about election law that just don't come from the academy? 
Yeah, um, to go to your first point, which was not the question you, maybe it's the question you wanted to ask, but you didn't exactly ask, but um, I'm not gonna take a side on um, uh, uh, what judges should be doing and what law schools they should hire from. There's a lot of discretion. Every judge does this differently. I do worry a little bit about judges, you know, putting themselves sort of front and center on issues that are kind of public issues of the day and getting out there too far and commenting on those, on those kinds of things. Um, so um, that would be my sort of only thought in terms of uh, judges publicly stating where, how they hire or who, where they hire, hire from. Uh, I, you know, the expert, the expert process, of course, is primarily done in the district court uh, where the experts are, are, are um, um, retained and uh, whether they, if they survive a motion allowed to testify. We see that evidence, obviously, in the record when it comes to us at the Court of Appeals. Uh, and you know you can, I mean, a lot of that lex experts have pretty deep seated views on one side or the other. So if there are experts that appear to be sort of quote unquote more neutral than others, I think those are gonna be influential to a court. But where you find them, I don't know. Uh, I've been out of, out of that business uh, for a while. And um, you know, I think courts do really appreciate um, expertise, right? Again, we're not, we're, not, we're not subject matter experts really on, on anything. And especially when you're getting into facts and and uh, and um, you know sort of policy and and, and that kind of thing, uh, we're oftentimes out of our depth. So we are looking for uh, reliable experts. Um, obviously, the firm action cases that the Supreme Court decided uh, a couple terms ago were you know significantly influenced by expert testimony on both sides. Uh, and I will say, if you can find you know folks who do appear to be um, somewhat neutral, or maybe sometimes to testify on each on different sides of things, that can be very helpful. But I'm not sure in today's day and age there are that many of those experts out there. So. A, a common issue in election-related litigation is intervention. Of course, on the one side of the V is usually a secretary of state, but often it's whether it's the state legislature or a political party seeking to, of course, intervene, defend its own interests. As a judge adjudicating these kinds of cases where that kind of intervention issue comes up and you're dealing with all various parties and interests on the same nominal side of the V, what's your, what's your view of that kind of intervention issue and whether it is ultimately beneficial for the courts actually addressing and adjudicating these questions? Yeah, it's a, I mean, probably a case-by-case -case determination. But uh, generally speaking, you want to ensure that both sides are adequately represented, that the that sort of the full picture of the legal case is presented to the court so we can you know, consider all the, all the legal issues and all the arguments. However we decide, if we at least want to feel like we've heard um, both sides or all sides of a case expressed uh, in detail. So uh, I, don't, you know, I don't have a blanket rule on it. Obviously, there are, there are federal rules that govern inter intervention, and we follow those. Um, I guess my general instinct is I'm, I'm, if there are parties that um, are deeply invested in the case and they want to intervene, um, they probably should be allowed to do so. Uh, short of that, there's the amicus process. And I, I will say in the amicus world, you know, when cases go to the Supreme Court, it's common to get 20 amicus briefs on each side. Uh, and so you start to wonder what the value is. In the circuit courts, that's not the case. It's rare that we have cases with amicus briefs. So if there's even one amicus brief, uh, that can make a big difference in a case. Uh, not dispositive, but if I, if I see an amicus brief, I know that someone outside the parties cares about the case. Uh, I know there might be some different angle to the case that I should consider. And that can be very, very helpful. So I think um, if, if you can't participate as an intervener, maybe you can at least file something with the court to express your, your view. And we read those and we, we take them seriously. Because you know the hard part, Hard part of our job, and in some ways it's deciding the case before us, but it's also to kind of look down the road and say, if we decide this case a certain way, what does it mean for a future case if you change the facts a little bit? And you know, my fear in judging is always not just sort of have I have this case right, but you know, two years from now, if another panel picks up one of my prior decisions and has to try to apply it to a slightly changed circumstance and think, boy, Judge Rayler just totally missed this major issue. You know, how could he have done that? Now we're stuck with this opinion that it doesn't, you know, didn't really kind of look down the road. Now, in truth, the lawyers probably didn't raise the issues that they're worried about, so it's not completely the judge's fault, but, but we do our best to account for those things. And so amicus briefs, my point is amicus briefs can sometimes help the court think about issues in a little more, in a broader perspective, um, not just in the dispute that's currently before them, but kind of how issues maybe fit together 
more broadly and why a certain rule of law would, would, would work better um, going forward in, in, in other cases. Uh, Judge, I would assume that, based on what you've just said, that um, if there's a party before you that uh, wants to have amicus briefs filed on their side, uh, the best thing they can do is to coordinate with the different parties that want to file an amicus brief to make sure that all of them, instead of, are, uh, instead of all of them covering the same issue, they're each covering a different issue that's important in the case. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, you know, over uh, supply of amicus briefs has not been a big problem in the, in the Sixth Circuit, at least. But if you're going to file them, I mean, a couple of you know, ground rules, uh, Hans, as, you, as you're pointing out, is one, don't just repeat what the parties are arguing. And if there are multiple briefs, do try to sort of coordinate those so you're, you're, you're bringing to the attention of the court new or distinct issues. Because we will read them, um, but if we get in sort of five pages and ten pages and haven't heard anything new, then we'll be less enthused about reading the, the rest of it. So don't bury the lead. Uh, and try to come in with a new perspective. Um, I suppose the other concern is you sometimes get amicus briefs that have nothing really to do with the case. Someone just had something they really wanted to say and wanted to, to give it to you, and it doesn't actually have much to do with the case with the case in front of you. But I do think coordination in that res sense works. And amicus briefs, I, I think, in the circuit court, um, I think we still have to agree to accept them. In the district courts, sometimes it works differently. Um, but I will forecast my view on that. I will. I will pretty much agree to accept any amicus brief. Um, so I mean, if it doesn't follow the rules or it's filed too late, which sometimes can kind of create a disadvantage for one side in being able to respond to it, I honor those. But otherwise, uh, I am you know, wanting typically more information rather than less, and I don't think I've voted to deny an amicus brief uh, in my career. But uh, that's not a uniform view uh, across the court. So um, if you're making a pitch for why the brief should be filed, make sure you're, you're as persuasive as you can be. Well, since you're talking about amicus briefs, um, hey, we you know, moved the, the topic. We moved the topic. Yeah. Well, please. yeah. Um, a, a question that gets debated so much amongst lawyers is how how important are the oral arguments? Because obviously, it's very important for a party to to file a well written, well argued brief. But but how how important are the oral arguments? I, I hear both sides of that. I mean, I hear some folks tell me oral arguments aren't going to make a difference. I hear others say, well, you could file a really good brief, but if you really uh, do a bad oral argument, that could affect your case. What, what, what's your view on yeah, that? Yeah, well, we have a lot of excellent lawyers here today and students, and I don't want to tell you that oral, argu oral argument doesn't matter. Uh, I feel like it would be crushing, and, and uh, that's the message you'd go home with today. But I, my views have, on oral argument certainly changed since I've gone on the bench. I think as a lawyer, I thought oral argument was everything. You know, every case was like an equipose. And I was going to come in and make the difference, and not from an arrogance perspective, just that I thought this is a close case, and the judges are going to be torn, and the argument will make all the difference in the world. And the fact is that you know we get extensive briefing before argument, so most of the time we, you know, me and probably the other panel members have a sense of kind of how the case should come out. And in our court, typically one judge is maybe assigned ahead of time to write the opinion. If they're in the majority, we don't talk about cases ahead of time, but. One judge might send around a bench memo to other judges if they're sort of the judge that's thought to be the lead judge for the case. And so you might get a sense of what another judge is thinking about the case, and you might have a sense of what you think about the case. And so there's a lot of you know, work done before oral argument. Um, so th there's two things. One, you know, for lawyers, like the most important skill is writing. It's great to be a good stand-up lawyer, but, but the, the, the cases are won or lost on the, on the briefs by and large. So being a good writer, uh, is extremely helpful. When people ask, you know, what's my number one tip for oral, oral advocacy, I say write a good brief uh, because then you come into court ahead, most likely. Uh, but then when you get to court, even if we have a sense of how the case is going to come out, occasionally, you know, my mind will switch. Occasionally something will happen where maybe I understood an issue one way and it's clarified for me in a different way and that was kind of dispositive. Um, maybe, you know, a, a, you can't come in with a brand new argument, but maybe something kind of shifts my view, maybe hearing from my colleagues, right? I was sort of thinking one thing, and then, I, and then one of my colleagues says something that makes me look at something another way. What I do think oral argument is most help, or what most, most likely to do in terms of changing a case is to change how a party wins. You know, it's likely one party is going to win, but maybe there's different ways they can win. There's a jurisdictional argument. There's something on the merits. Maybe there's a waiver or forfeiture point. And oral argument will also often help sort of crystallize the, the sort of the highest ground that we can decide the case on. What's what's you know the, the way that we 
we're going to go in this case. Obviously, we have to do jurisdiction, but, but maybe there are different ways you can decide a case. Oral argument can be very helpful sort of for fleshing out uh, those issues. But, but you know, oral argument does matter. Uh, I have seen bad arguments that have certainly hurt parties and good arguments that have helped them. And um, I think we're about the end of the time, so I hope to see many of you in the Sixth Circuit uh, in the coming years. Well, Judge, thank you very much for speaking to us today. Uh, we are at the end of our session. We give him a round of applause. So. And uh, we are we're going to take a 15-minute break. We're going to start up again at 1 o'clock with another very important panel. And um, my boss makes me want to make the, uh, the trains run on time. So be, be back in your seat at 1 o'clock, and we will get going again. Please welcome back Hans von Spakovsky. The Honorable Daniel Dorjani, and he works for an organization that won, I think, one of the most important cases in the last many decades um, defending the First Amendment rights of Americans, Citizens United. So they do a lot of uh, very important, very good work, and uh, they're going to talk about the challenges, pot potential legal challenges ahead uh, for the Trump campaign. And uh, you know all about legal challenges, not only from your work at Citizens United, but your prior work in the federal government also. So, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hans, for that kind introduction. It's an honor and pleasure being here. Let's get right to the panel. Please, gentlemen, come on up. Uh, and we're going to have Mike Davis joining us remotely. I think everybody knows our panelists, so I'll keep these intros short. Mike Davis is the former chief counsel for nominations for Chairman Grassley at the Senate Judiciary Committee. In that role, he oversaw floor votes for 278 nominees, including for Justice Kavanaugh and for a record number of appellate judges. He has clerked twice for Neil Gorsuch, once for Judge Gorsuch, and once for Justice Gorsuch. In addition to being a talented litigator, Mike runs the Article III Project, which defends constitutionalist judges, and the Internet Accountability Project, which reigns in big tech. And he has nearly as many Twitter followers as Elon Musk. It's incredible. <laughs> Next, <coughs> we have Dan McLaughlin. Dan is a senior writer at National Review Online and a fellow at the National Review Institute. He is a former New York City litigator and is now perhaps best known on Twitter as Baseball Crank, where he has well over 100,000 followers. His Twitter bio identifies him as, if I have this correct, a Reaganite, a Catholic, a New Yorker, and apparently as a Mets fan. To paraphrase Meatloaf, three out of four ain't bad. <laughs> Last but not least, <clears throat> Steve Roberts is a partner at Holtzman Vogel and one of the nation's leading political law experts. He brings a granular level of knowledge to campaign finance law, election law, and election day operations. He combines that with a strategic vision <laughs> that helps his clients allocate their resources efficiently and effectively. That's why well-financed presidential campaigns seek him out, as do major trade associations and Fortune 500 companies. In addition to serving most recently as the GC for Vivek for President, he was also the Deputy GC for President Trump's Presidential Inaugural Committee. Gentlemen, shall we begin? Mike, are you there? I am here, and thank you for letting me join Mike remotely. Mike Davis, gotta... are you there? <laughs> Mike. I am here. The superstar. How are you? Doing great, thank you. Hey, Lawfare. What is it? Is there something new about it this cycle? And did something happen, I don't know, in the last 24 hours that might be worthwhile bringing to people's attention? Mike, take it away. Yeah, so we have unprecedented republic ending lawfare by President Biden and Kamala Harris and their Justice Department and their Democrats, prosecutors in uh, New York and Atlanta, Georgia, and even in Arizona now uh, with another uh, another matter. So what they're trying to do to President Trump, they tried to bankrupt Trump 
for non-fraud. They've tried to throw him in prison for the rest of his life for non-crimes. They've tried to take him off the ballots in Colorado and Maine and maybe elsewhere. And when the Supreme Court stepped up and stopped them, they're trying to destroy the Supreme Courts that got in their way through court packing. And uh, they also have underfunded President Trump's Secret Service protection and almost got him killed twice, right? So that didn't work. And so what have they done? The Democracy Party has decided to uh, to gut Joe Biden in a bloodless coup, throw out 14 million Democrat primary voters, uh, and install Kamala Harris, who got zero uh, primary votes. And so the party of democracy has really proven it with their actions this election cycle. Let's talk about some of these cases against President Trump. And we have a civil fraud case in New York by New York Attorney General Tish James, Big Tish, as I call her. She uh, has teamed up with Arthur Ingeron, a New York judge who is a total partisan goofball. And they have alleged that Trump has somehow committed fraud in New York when he uh, paid back sophisticated Wall Street banks on time, in full, as agreed with interest. And one of the big things that they say tr how Trump defrauded these sophisticated banks is that he overvalued Mar-a-Lago. He said that Mar-a-Lago was worth close to a half billion dollars, where they think that Mar-a-Lago is worth $18 million, which is just laughable on its face. If you just go to Zillow, you can see that a tennis court at, in Mar-a-Lago would be worth more than $18 million. That's the ta what, what the tax assessor has down it is records for tax purposes, not for valuation purposes. You have 20 acres of the most prime real estate in the world. It touches the intracoastal waterway in the Atlantic o Ocean. It's one of the most unique properties in the world. It's clearly worth more than $18 million, but that is the basis of this civil fraud lawsuit. They were able to get this fraud finding before uh, Judge Ingeron just decreed that there was fraud no jury trial on that issue. And then they've assessed nearly a half billion dollars in uh, unconstitutional fines and penalties against President Trump. This is even too crazy for the New York Appellate Division because just recently there was oral argument on this in this case. And it seems like all five judges on the Appellate Division thinks that this is an absolutely insane legal theory. They're trying to use a New York statute, a consumer protection statute intended for persistent fraud to go after a private business transaction uh, between a businessman and sophisticated Wall Street banks. It's, it's silly, but it's just part of this lawfare against Trump. We have four criminal indictments against Trump. Number one, they raided President Trump in Mar-a-Lago, the office of former president in Mar-a-Lago, for presidential records that Trump was allowed to have under the Presidential Records Act. And it does not matter whether they're classified or not. That's why former presidents get the Office of Former President with Secret Service protection, with federally funded staff, with security clearances, with secure office space. But the librarians at the National Archives, Gary Stern and the archivist, uh, Democrat operatives, have uh, they turned a routine records dispute over the Presidential Records Act somehow into an Espionage Act case. Thank God Judge Cannon dismissed that case because she held that the special counsel, Jack Smith, his, his appointment was unconstitutional. That will go up to the 11th Circuit. It will probably go up to the Supreme Court. It won't get resolved before the election. And so uh, presumably Trump wins and that case goes away. We have two January 6 cases. One with Jack Smith, again, he got a bad draw with Judge Cannon in the presidential records case in Mar-a-Lago. So he did the highly unusual move of indicting the same criminal defendants in two different venues, one down in the Southern Dif District of Florida for the Presidential Records Act. And then he indicted Trump for January 6th because somehow it is a crime to object to a presidential election, which is allowed by the Electoral Count Act of 1887. Democrats objected to Republican wins in 19, 
69, 2001, 2005, and 2017, but we don't see Al Gore and uh, John Kerry and Hillary Clinton in prison uh, for objecting to those wins. January 6th was a lawful protest permitted by the National Park Service that devolved into a riot. And there are three categories of people who were there that day. There were people who were there peacefully and did not trespass. And even if you think they're wrong, even if you think they're crazy, they have a First Amendment right to be there. Then you have people who trespassed into the Capitol who should be charged with trespass. And then there were people who were violent who should be charged with violence. But to say that there was an insurrection when Jack Smith didn't charge insurrection is defamatory, frankly. And I just find it amazing that when I ran the Kavanaugh confirmation, there were a lot of people who were threatening senators and their staff throughout the building during those proceedings and not a damn thing happened to them. They were trying to stop the peaceful transfer of power at the Supreme Court of the United States. They interrupted the proceedings. Nothing happened to them. But uh, if you're Trump and his supporters, uh, then they throw the book at you. Um, and again, if the, the one charge that Trump, if Trump actually incited the riots on January 6th, he could be charged. But there's no evidence that Trump incited the riot. To the contrary, he told his supporters to go there peacefully that day. So you have that Jack Smith indictment in D.C. The Supreme Court of the United States uh, held in two cases, one in the Fisher decision in June, that the Biden-Harris Justice Department illegally contorted, politicized, and weaponized, essentially, they, that they, they misapplied a post-Enron obstruction of justice statute intended for corporate fraud to go after your political to their to go after their political enemies and that applied to other January 6th defendants but two of the four counts against Trump are these post Enron 1512 charges that the Supreme Court said that the Biden Harris Justice Department can't use somehow Jack Smith has ignored that and uh, brought uh, a, a superseding indictment with those same two charges uh, the, uh, that the Fisher case said you can't use. He also, uh, Jack Smith also brought a charge for uh, essentially uh, for uh, a, a conspiracy against rights is one of the charges, 18 U.S.C. Section 241, uh, which is kind of uh, rich considering that it, when you politicize and weaponize your intel agencies and law enforcement against your political enemies, you are actually engaging in a criminal conspiracy against rights under 18 U.S.C. Section 241. Uh, Tanya